All right, I'm here with Nathaniel Robinson. Here's the founder and CEO of Trustworthy. Trustworthy is a B2B2C SaaS company. They are building the family operating system, super interesting product, and we're going to dive into it. He founded the company in 2020 after a life in VP of corporate marketing at, at Oracle, VP marketing at VMware, where he's currently investor and advisor at a bunch of companies like Little Fund and Rewatch. And Trustworthy raised the Series A in 2020 for 50 million. So we're going to dive into the founding story, why he created this product, what this product is about, you know, how they're going about uh growing and scaling um so that's going to be the podcast today nathaniel thank you for joining me hey finn nice to be here first question what's a family operating system <laughs> yeah I'm, i think probably everyone has a good answer for that um because uh we discovered in talking to lots and lots of families what they'd built for themselves and, and what that constituted and that was a real inspiration point for us in figuring out, hey, what what should the solution be for families? Uh, but it's something that it's sort of a name that we coined that stuck. Like we tried lots of different things. I like it. Has a ring to it. Yeah. Yeah. It has, it, you know, it has it's big, right? It could be a lot of things, right? Yeah. It could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And I, I think we like that aspect to it. Um also, you know, it's borrowing from the sort of te technical or hardware realm. Uh and we're sort of applying a software approach to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially what it means is uh, a set of workflows and information that help you run your household more efficiently, uh, help you stay on top of all the related critical tasks across your household, uh, and gives you a secure and reliable place to keep your important information uh, so that you have agency and utility from it. Uh, so that you can do the things that you want, maybe even monetize your information uh, and and have benefit from it your whole life or maybe your whole adult life uh, as a more practical approach. Uh, and that ultimately uh, is something that creates a, a, a leg is a legacy for you, something that you pass on to your loved ones uh, when when you you know when you ultimately uh, pass away and and your estate transitions to other people, is that we took this whole life approach, right? It's something you could adopt in your 20s or 30s and use your whole life long and get benefit from and that your heirs would then also benefit from. And there's a lot of elements across that time span, if you like. Right. Uh, but the underpinning is, look, we're in the information age. Uh, people, families didn't have a system to manage all that important information and the amount of information that they now have to manage uh, is growing exponentially, uh, and all the related critical tasks in terms of staying on top of that. Why? Why isn't there a system for consumers right. and all and their related eco ecosystems? And by that, I mean the B two B part of the equation. Uh, so trustworthy uh, today is a family operating system. Does really three big important things. One is uh, a very secure and private platform for family information. Number two is uh, a very collaborative approach to what we call the trust graph, which means who do you trust with some of your information mm. for how long and when do you when do you want them to have it? Uh, and then the last really important part that we've done is sort of uh, automation around the curation and, and ongoing maintenance and management of your system. So those are three you know really big important parts of what we've built today. I'm happy to dive into all of them if you want, but Right. That's what we think of as the family operating system. The reasons to use it and the reasons that we've seen people build things for themselves. We're really inspired by the systems, analog paper-based systems, files, folders, what it, you know, anything you can imagine. I have it in Evernote. To, <laughs> That's mine. Yeah, okay, great. So Evernote's a good one. We hear that a lot. To so Every digital, off-the-shelf digital sort of productivity solution you can imagine. We've seen Monday.com. We've seen Trello. We've seen the iPhone, you know, photo folders where I right. keep my important documents and looked at all the systems and said, great, let's just use one of those. We'll build it ourselves and realize that the off the shelf tools fell short in some of the arenas um, that we that we wanted to bolster uh, and that they weren't really meeting the needs of families in the way that we thought, look, we could build something better that was purpose built mm -hmm. uh, to give families a secure place to give them 
uh, information in their pocket whenever they needed it to give them a secure transport layer around their information. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the goal is self-sovereign identity, right? Meaning that I own my own information. I have agency and utility from it. I just I decide where it goes and I decide how it's right. monetized, right? That's sort of a North Star for us. So to make it a little bit more tangible, it's basically a dashboard where I have all of my family idea, IDs, uh, insurance documents, properties Property, that I might own, bank yeah, account information. And yeah, I have it for myself, yeah. for my family, and I can share it with other people. So I want to give my my mother or my father-in-law or our nanny certain access to certain parts of it. I can do that through the platform and they can, you know, um, have certain emergency access or power of attorney for certain things and um, manage it through that. And the product is currently in market, right? Like people can sign up and actually use it. Yeah, just go to trustworthy.com, 14-day free trial, choose a plan after that. Uh, it's a SaaS-based subscription plan. Yeah. Uh, one year is sort of the minimum subscription you Makes can sense. get, but you can get three, five, 10-year subscription as well. And how long did it take you guys to build it? <laughs> We're still building it. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it's a, Getting it's it out big, to the market. <laughs> yeah, it took us, I mean, uh, maybe 12 months to bring the first version to market. And the first version, you know, was not the version we have today. Obviously, it's a product where we went kind of broad across a lot of categories and not very deep initially. And then we've gone back through and we're we're going deeper in each category, um, sort of dictated by the needs of customers, right? As, right. as we hear from them, hey, could you do this or that? Um, exactly. That bubbles, those things bubble to the top. We've also spent some time building for sort of the outer circle, the trusted professionals. Uh, and this is really part of our go-to-market approach, which was, let's go bottom up, right? Let's go to consumers first. Mm -hmm. They'll, because of the product-led growth elements of Trustworthy, they'll invite their accountant or their estate planning attorney or their wealth advisor or their realtor or insurance broker or you know any one of the folks that their family might work with. Uh, and they will discover trustworthy in in that sense. And then we've had those professionals come to us and say, "This client invited me. I would like to use this with my other clients. How do I do that?" Right. Um, so this is really kind of a, a, a dual approach in some ways uh, to to grow, to, you know, totally. to grow the business in a hopefully organic way uh, that makes sense. And um, we do a little bit of marketing, or really partnership on the business side, you know, where there's an organization like a bank or mm -hmm. an insurance company uh, that says, hey, look, we have lots of agents uh, who we think this could, or wealth advisors or professionals who could benefit and our clients will ultimately benefit. You know, how do we, how do we deploy this? How do we trial this and see how it goes? But most of our growth is through organic acquisition on the consumer side where we create content around life moments a life moment could be i'm getting married you know we're we're going to commingle our assets this is a great wedding gift for for the couple kind of thing uh or we're having a child now we really want to get things dialed in because we have this life to take care of right or we're you know lots of you know i'm starting a new job i've got to transition my old 401ks um you know i'm i'm is this retiring. just for I'm, is this just yeah. for us people or because of like bank accounts and all of that stuff, is it only U.S.? Today, uh, we're, we're focused on the U.S. market. We do have folks using Trustworthy all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, uh, the Middle East. Uh, we have family offices in particular who are using Trustworthy mm -hmm. around the world um, because of the kinds of assets that they have and tend to have in, in, in those kinds of structures. Why did you start this company? I mean, it looks like your background is in kind of corporate marketing world and is it just you got excited about the opportunity or is there some personal story about why you care about this particular problem? Well, a couple of things that happened around the time we were thinking about creating a company. Um, my co-founder and I had have worked at a couple of previous companies, one of which was Microsoft. Uh, and we'd been acquired through another company there called MileIQ. And MileIQ was unique, uh, was pretty unique in that it was a mileage logging app, which in the US is great because people can get uh, tax deduction or reimbursement from mm -hmm. their employer. 
but doing the act of doing mileage logging is really laborious, right? So the app took the location signal on the phone and turned that in automatically turned that into a mileage log. Whenever you drove, it logged the drives and uh, bada bing, bada boom, you had this automated mileage log that you could then, you know, get money from. And the average, the average person, a uh, user who was driving a lot for their job, their sales job or whatever, uh, was getting about seventy five hundred dollars a year back in deductions wow. or reimbursement. So it was material, it was sort of a sleeper, uh, really valuable, you know, but not very exciting uh, or sexy business. But the the essence of that was taking some information from you and turning it into something of value. So we really mm-hmm. loved that concept. Uh, and and when we got acquired into Microsoft, we were busy, you know, building other businesses as part of Office. Uh, we were building some family safety stuff. We were working on my like you still. We were working on some uh, new functionality in, in the fintech space for Microsoft. And also at the same time, uh, my co-friend and I had started family. So we're really thinking about the needs of families and our <laughs> selfishly our own needs. Um, and and particularly, we started in the uh, legal space thinking about estate plans because we had estate plans. And we had them for a while, but they sort of atrophied, right? That the documents had become out of date and not right. sort of not very useful anymore. Uh, and we we're like, well, could suffer help with that and keep them up to date somehow and, you know, automatically um, change things in and out. And as we talked to more and more people about, it, we just found that, okay, well, legal was just one piece of the pie that they were grappling with now that there were insurances and property and, you know, like, this array of information that was all siloed in different places that the, that were concerned that they were going to lose something of value. Like, what if I lose track of that 401k? I just, I was at a real estate conference a couple of weekends ago and the sort of penultimate version of this was like, oh, I had a client, his parents passed away. Each parent had million dollar life insurance policies that they could not find, right? Mm. And no one knew where they oh were. Right? And you know, they looked, you know, no. they looked really hard. They knew it existed, just couldn't find the, the policies anywhere. And like, oh man, like, that's like losing your Bitcoin keys, right? Wait, but uh, you must reach out to the insurance company, no? And just say, here's my name. Well, which insurance company? Oh, right. <laughs> God damn. So that's sort of a classic example of something of value that's gotten lost and, you know, maybe can be recovered, sure. But how, mu- how much time and effort to recover it? Um, and and if you multiply that by you know the the silos of information, all the assets across everyone's lives, that becomes meaningful, right? Um, and really, you know, I'm sure not what the family intended, right? Well, we got a, we got these life insurance policies for a reason, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But we've heard this again and again, you know, things where things got lost, where we weren't on top of things, and we ended up paying penalties or late fees or overages, or it cost our credit score. Um, we uh, talked to an investor recently and he said, oh, my wife's Canadian. We were going to Canada. Uh, the day before we went, we realized her passport was out. That was, and, I was about to say that. I was just thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and she had to fly to some other part of Texas where they live. And I was like, well, how expensive was that? Like, how much would you have paid yeah. to be notified by trustworthy that your passport's going to expire in 30 that. or 90 days? Right. So that's that's one of the big things is we do we do is we help and just curate your information, get it all secure and safe and trustworthy. And then as we're ingesting information, we say, okay, does this thing have an expiration date? Let's automatically create a reminder for you 30, 60, 90 days, depending on whether it's a driver's license or passport or a term life insurance policy or something else to notify you that this thing is going to expire. Um, and that you have give you some time to you know to That's do the great. task. Even we even connect you to the place, like the state department or wherever you need to go to remedy that situation. Right in the mm-hmm. future, we want to make that a whole closed loop for you um, as government brings more and more things online and the ability to process you know renewals online. That's already happening. So the more we can close the loop for you and say, hey, you're we've. We renewed your passport. It's going to show up in your in your mailbox. You know uh, that's what we're aiming for. But we're mm-hmm. doing you know I don't know two thirds of it today. Right. By the way, side note on that word concept. Did I did I hear like a New Zealand accent slip through? Yeah. 
Slightly. I, I mean, yeah, I'm from New Zealand. I've um, okay. I've been in the United States for a couple of decades. So okay, interesting. Um, do you feel so? When you talk about this, I'm like, I kind of need this. Like, is like my stuff is currently in Evernote. There's like copies of files and like a passport. And when I need to send it over, I need to like pull out the PDF and send it to someone in an email, etc. Um, mm. And especially the passport expiration date, because yeah, I can see myself totally missing that. But then I'm also thinking, oh, it's kind of weird. One, to have a software for our family. I have tons of software for my business. I don't have a single software subscription for a family, I would say. Maybe Netflix, if but that's not really software. I guess that's uh that's entertainment. Entertainment. Yeah. So and then obviously it's super critical information, right? I mean, it's literally the most sensitive information I would be uploading there all into one place. You wouldn't just have my ID, you would have my bank information, my insurance policies, <laughs> and everything. So first question is how one is this like behavioral change for families is that a thing that you have to deal with kind of like change management but for families you know the there's the first part of what you said there it's like you have a system and and it's already you know online or on a device somewhere right, right? so that's you know you tough the battle really the question i would pose to you is like it might be great for you but does your partner or spouse know where nope. it is do they know? Yeah. So that's a big part of the reason that people do this is if I get hit by a bus today, mm. will my loved ones know where to go to find the, what we, what we kind of call trustworthy is the treasure map, right? Not everything has to be in trustworthy. You just have to have a pointer to where it lives. Oh. And the story behind this is early on uh, in our alpha phase, we had a retired Navy captain who was a customer. and. He said, well, I have uh, precious metals buried on my property. And we're, we were like, oh, that's that's cool. That's, you sound kind of like a pirate. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> um, in the Navy and had a lot of precious metals. Um, yeah. And for, does your family know what tree, you know, what tree or hedge line or whatever they're buried under? And he was like, yeah, I think they do. But that sort of became the metaphor for like trustworthy is the treasure map to like, where are all the important things? What are the operational instructions around those things? Mm -hmm. And where do they, you know, where, where is everything? And so that's actually, it's a good thing. Like, you know, that you would invite your spouse, of course, maybe aunts, uncles, or adult, you know, your parents or adult children, uh, maybe siblings, trustees, guardians. So they at least knew about, where this where the important information is where those life insurance policies might be for example right um and it doesn't have to be untrustworthy but you could just have a thing that says okay it's in the third drawer in the filing cabinet right that's where it lives right um i think also a good reason to probably have a digital backup in trustworthy because you know not every safe is fireproof or disaster proof and we've heard plenty of those stories hey wish we'd had trustworthy before the tornado or hurricane or the wildfire or flood, you know, unfortunately, it's too late after the fact. Compelling reasons are ready to at least have a backup and trustworthy um, in a digital age, right? Where increasingly, the, all the things that you get are not in an analog format. They're not arriving in the mail as much anymore or not at all, right? They just arrive as an attachment in your email uh, or in your browser or something like that. Yeah. And so how do you manage all that digital information was really the thing that we're that we're trying to help families with right um, i'm curious i'm curious how you think about future possible security leaks because you know when i when i'm going to ask you about security i'm sure you're going to tell me we're hipaa compliant we're SOC 2 we pay a lot of attention to cyber to security and all of these things which i sure i'm sure you do but if you're really successful and you get millions of people using this product i mean you must know that this is going to be a treasure trove for hackers right so how are you thinking more as like a founder or person possibly dealing in the future with some event of how to approach this or even think about this or you know deal with the pressure of that i guess yeah uh well there's lots of solutions that we can enable for people to feel more secure about their information mm -hmm. and there's this interesting spectrum uh that my 
locksmith likes to remind me about. So he's the guy that, you know, would come and help me secure my house. Yeah. Uh, and he says, you're, there's a spectrum of convenience to security, right? And you have to decide where you want to be on that spectrum. Um, and ultimately, we want to give anyone the choice. I want to be very far on the secure side, which means less convenience or yep. maybe minimum of convenience. Um, I want to be somewhere in the middle or I want to be, you know, more convenient, still secure, but way more convenient, meaning yeah. I can quickly access things. Uh, and the analogy he gives is like, you know, your bicycle, um, you can leave it in front of your house, unlocked, um, not very secure, but very convenient. You could just walk out, get on and ride off, yep. right? Or you could put the bicycle in the back of the garage. It's locked to the wall. It's covered in a top hole and uh, way more secure, right? People can't drive by and just see see it. Uh, and but less way less convenient. You have to take the top pulling off, unlock it, yep. bring it to the front uh, before you can ride it. And I think that's a basic analogy of the spectrum that we aim to cover. Um, today, you know, we've invested heavily in secure a secure and private platform. All the SOC two, SOC three, HIPAA, GDPR compliances, uh, which are great standards for. Um, mm, monitoring and making sure that your practices are consistent right um across your team across your customers across the business um we checked all the boxes there and we had invested early in that because we had to be secure um beyond that we have some secret source called tokenization uh which is basically uh taking the really sensitive information in your account and then extrapolating the bits into lots of different places. Um, okay. Think of walking into a, a vault with lots of safety deposit boxes and say your social security number. Uh, we take all the digits and put them in different boxes and you don't know which mm -hmm. ones are which or which order to retrieve mm -hmm. them in unless you have the token. Mm -hmm. um, meaning, and you're the only one that has the token for that number in your account. So that's some secret sauce that we've added on top of all the other bits and pieces that we have. Of course, you can't even create an account with a route of a robust password uh, and a verified email. You have to have two-factor authentication on by default. You can't not have two-factor authentication. We have lots of forms of two-factor authentication, so biometrics. Uh, you can use a YubiKey with Trustworthy, which is a hardware key, verifying your present when you log into your account. There's a really a lot of robust capability around the security of the platform. Today, we uh, want to have access to some of your information or have the software have access so that we can help improve your system, right? That we, you know, the sort of way we talk about trust is, is um, protect and optimize your system. So the protect is put it in trustworthy because for the vast majority of people, what we've learned is that adopting trustworthy is actually a meaningful step up in family information security, right? right. Going through sort of the hoops that we make you jump through to create an account uh, and giving you some of the optionality. Um, the, the real problem is still, uh, you know, uh, social hacking, right? That someone calls you on the phone or you're online or something and you inadvertently give away your password. Uh, to trustworthy and they try and log in and they still don't have your second factor authentication, which is why we enforce that. But that's really the risk is that some kind, some element of social hacking is the, probably the biggest risk, the human, the human element. The idea is that most families will be in a much more secure posture in, by adopting trustworthy. Now today, uh, we don't have a on device only version of trustworthy, but we will, right? And the mm, future is if you only want your information to live on your phone or your or your computer and you hold the keys, uh, this is sort of at the very secure end of the spectrum. Yep. We will have that version. I'm not sure if it'll be this year, but not not too not too far away. Cool. Um, meaning so that's that's an inconvenient but very secure solution. Meaning if you lose the keys. Yep. We won't be able to recover the information for you, right? Same as yep. your Bitcoin yep. uh, keys. Uh, so, you know, there's a whole spectrum there. Uh, ultimately, we want to have access to some of your information or have the software look at it and say, hey, look, we think this thing that you have could be better or cheaper, mm -hmm. right? Your car insurance, for example. No one wants to shop car insurance. Everyone knows they're getting a bad deal, um, especially if you stay with the you know, your loyalty discount isn't really that great over time. No one wants to spend time shopping the car insurance. 
software can do that for you and say, hey, look, we think there's a better deal over here for the same coverage. Let's optimize this thing for you. Or, hey, look, there's a gap in your system. You don't seem to have a uh, an estate plan today, for example. Lots of people don't. Um, could Would you be interested in filling that blank in your system uh, with and work with one of our providers? Uh, yep. You know, we'll refer you to one of our partners. So that's really the optimized part. We started with reminders and uh, expiration dates because that's actually really impactful in terms of uh, avoiding late fees and penalties and overages. And the average family, the number that came out last year and it keeps going up, is now paying uh, about $1,300 in penalties and late fees, mm-hmm. um, which is a, it's a crazy number, right? A huge number. And it was like $900 a year before and then like 800 something the year before that. It keeps going up. So there's sort of an inflationary line that goes with these fees, which is ridiculous. But if we can help you avoid just that number by staying on top of things, we've won. We've helped, right? We've we've done our job. We helped you avoid the time in building your own system by adopting Trustworthy. The average is 56 hours a year in sort of household management uh, or managing household related things. Uh, And then peace of mind, right? That's really the kicker here is you have peace of mind knowing that everyone in your life has access to the right information at the right time. You can now build the the business case, the ROI case on uh, on using trustworthy. What have you learned about the psychology of building trust with consumers? Because clearly you sell a product where you guys need to build a lot of trust. And I feel like the funny thing about consumer trust is you can have all of the compliances and you know facts on the website but if barack obama says that they're using trustworthy people do Mm. not care about looking at any of that stuff and they will sign up for it um what have you learned about how to build trust with with consumers yeah i mean consumers are fickle (laughs) to your to your point right like oh sock two sock three compliance but what does that actually mean to me DDR compliance, you know, that was 10 years ago. Uh, what does that actually mean to me? Um, I think you're right. I think if if you you want, you know, the things that they look for, do you have people saying nice things about you, you know, reviews? Like, do you have lots of nice reviews? Have you been publicly covered by known press sources? You know, mm-hmm. um, do you have media coverage? Are you are you of some, someone of some repute? Did you work at Apple? Did you work at mm-hmm. you know the sort of social proof of like mm-hmm. designed by people from Apple or you know those kinds of reference points? Um, those will carry weight. You know those things matter to consumers. Uh, we had a, a support ticket the other day where someone wrote in and said, "I deleted your app because you don't say your app is secure." Uh-huh. And <laughs> we talk about all the. You know, we have, if you go to trustworthy.com forward slash security, it's right in the top banner of the site, security, because yep. we know it's important to folks. Um, that didn't matter. Like we have pages and pages of here's how we keep your information secure. Uh, but you didn't say it's secure was the kicker for that person, right? So, you know, we just have to say now in the headline on the homepage, it's secure. It's secure. <laughs> <laughs> just trust us. We're trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Um, yeah, so it it is it feels fickle. Like you spend so much time and money on the the securing the platform and uh, all the things that go around that, and then someone comes along and says, "But you didn't say it's secure." Okay, well, yeah, are you guys tracking if any like high profile people sign up for your product? Because that would probably um, be, be a massive booster, right? If you get like. We, so we work with some family offices who have very high profile celebrity clients that we know we know their information is trustworthy um, people you would recognize instantly. Yeah. And but we just we can't talk about that. Obviously, right. I not, mean, they need to be fine really with the point it. Of yeah. our, it's not really the point of our business is is, you know, l- you know, it's nice for every business is if some celebrity wants to come out and say, oh, I use trustworthy. Great. That'd be super helpful. Yeah. Um, but we're not just for celebrity businesses right we're for every or families we're, we're for every family right uh because we believe every family can benefit and and that's the mission how do we help families in in the digital economy in, in, a, in a world of digital transformation right no i'm just thinking in, in terms of trust building that influencer marketing could be interesting 
We and we have done a little bit of that, and that's something we will do more of probably this year. Uh, is working with the right influencers. Uh, we work with one guy right now called Chris Hutchins, who has a really great blog called All the Hacks. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best thing about Chris is he only really mentions us where we're relevant to the topic of his mm-hmm. current uh, podcast. Right. Right. Makes sense. We're not we're not just advertising across all the podcasts. So um, those kinds of relationships are really helpful. And we, you know, we absolutely know that makes a difference. Cool. What have you learned about fundraising, given that you guys huh. seem to have a non-traditional <laughs> play here? Yeah, it's not a it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Mm-hmm. It's not a good time to be a consumer app, like everyone mm-hmm. knows that. Uh and and uh mm, I think it's hard to Hard for venture capitalists to believe that consumer apps can get big anymore, but obviously there will be, well, and and I guess sustain, right? You know, the the mm-hmm. age of being able to build consumer businesses. Although look at TikTok, that's a relatively big consumer business, right? Um, that's recent. I don't know. I, they just seem few and far between, right? Like, how do you build sustainable consumer businesses? So I think for that reason, we like to take bites or both sides of the apple, right? That that our business isn't just consumer led, that we have a B2B component as well, or B2B2C component. Uh, We're just at this realtor conference and the realtor was like, hey, can I buy Trustworthy for my clients when we close a a transaction? I want to land all their mortgage documents and their, their title documents and their closing statement. You get a bunch of documents when you close a house. Uh, I want to land them all in trustworthy and hand that to them as a gift, right? That's a great gift. Mm. And we're like, yeah, absolutely. Go to the partner portal, sign up, and then buy any number of licenses that you want for those clients. Uh, we talk to large financial institutions all the time about deploying trustworthy to uh, well-to-do clients, right? How do we how do we differentiate ourselves as a firm? How do we deal with onboarding? You guys do a great job of onboarding. How do we deal with digital relationship management? All the thing. How do we how do we appeal to a mo- a new generation of clients that we know are likely not going to use their parents' wealth advisors? Right. Mm-hmm. How do we give them a digital service that they expect uh, and be part of that system and part of the ecosystem with them? So there's a whole nother side to our business. Um, but it's really about bringing the two halves together is, you know, families have their own ecosystem that extend into these professional ecosystems as well. The, the professionals have created, uh, have lots of their own software, right. To run their own business, like wealth advisors is a good example. Um, CRM systems, what, you know, financial Mm -hmm. management systems and a little tiny bit of like, this is for the client. (laughs) Like we tack that on, but no one use not surprisingly, none of the clients use those portals that have been created right. because they suck, right? Yeah. And, and that's not really what they're created for. So we've sort of taken the opposite approach is like, let's build something for the client, the family first, and then let's incorporate that into the world of those professionals. What have you learned running ads on CNBC, CNN, Fox, Discovery, ESPN? I think it's run ads a couple of times what's called remnant mostly remnant television ads which is what most software companies will do because it's way cheaper what does that Um, mean it means you're not buying prime time right you're not buying prime time ads uh which are you know like a million dollars for 30 seconds that you're that there's lots of slots across lots of channels that the that the um the networks are trying to sell Mm -hmm. right advertising into um, so you can be on CNN, you know, at six and five in the morning, four in the morning, or, you know, mm-hmm. late night, right. uh, and get a sort of reasonable rate, uh, and that you, that you create a budget, you know, like a starting budget might be $300,000 these days. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not cheap, but the reason you had it so big is you have to try lots of different day parts across lots of different channels to see where your audience lives. Mm. Right. Um, so is, is it a news audience? Is it a sports audience? Is it a daytime audience? Is it a, you know, uh, HGTV kind of like cooking show kind of audience? You don't really know until you try everything and you find, okay, well, it looks like these things worked. We, we do spike analysis around, okay. uh, right. You know, we look at the baseline of signups. Was there a spike when this, when this ad, you know, 
slightly before, slightly after this ad ran? And was that effective in terms of CAC? Right. So is it a 30 second clip or how much do you get? Uh, usually it's for Remnant, it's a 15 or a 30 and you get yeah, so you get both and you try both. And sometimes one is more effective than the other. It's a TikTok video. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, pretty much. How, I'm just interested by the economics. So how many placements would you get for 300,000? Like how many times does it get shown on like different times? It depends times? a little bit on the season, the TV uh -huh. season, right? If it sweeps or are you running during an election? Are you running during uh -huh. some event? Uh, we had an ad run once uh, that cleared. So sometimes you try and buy an ads and they, they don't clear. But we had an ad ran once during a big sports event. We got a huge spike. Okay. But we couldn't, there's no way we could have anticipated. It's, it's sort of a fluke, right? That you A happy fluke, uh -huh. right? We had once uh, an, an ad ran during a, some event with the queen that you know was being covered on a channel here that we just have to happen to have an ad run on another huge spike interesting but there's no you know, the only way other way to get that is to say hey i know this event's happening i want to specifically buy an ad in those time slots but that's going to cost you millions of dollars usually right. i see um so sometimes you can get lucky with those sort of lucky clearances what's your takeaway was it worth it overall will you do it again or was it i'm not sure yeah uh maybe in the next round of funding we'd do it uh, you have to have a lot of, you have to have a big budget to, to right. sort of back into it and run for at least three months. Longer is better because you the seasonality in television, right? Like, you know, running through the summer may, may not make as much sense as running in the spring and fall. And right? everyone's outside in the summer. You guys, eventually you guys do a Super Bowl ad. That's probably, it's probably a nice spike. Um, yeah. I mean, I think everyone aspires to that. I don't know. I, it's. It's a flash in the pan, right? It's like a media cycle. Totally. You really want something that, that's sustainable. That's the beauty of like organic content is once you build up a, a body of content, it tends to perform for a long period of time. And is the idea with running ads on, you know, these channels, because families are on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they're also on TikTok, they're on Twitter, that you just get some added credibility if you're on advertising on CNBC rather than someone seeing a picture of you guys on Instagram while scrolling? Uh, I think it'll work. You get uh, you get more time if you're lucky to explain what your app or service is about, right? That you get a, a block of 15 or 30 seconds to try and convey everything that you need to, you know, why families need your solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that on TikTok as well to some degree. But you know, people are scrolling. You can't scroll. You can't scroll TV. You can walk away you or can change mute channel. It. Change channel. You yeah, it, but you're still getting the visual. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah. Um, pros and cons. I think the reason more software companies have been doing television is the reliability. The cost of social media has gone up. The reliability and tracking, knowing what was performing, right? The the mm -hmm. the, the throughput has become spurious at best in my in my mind mm -hmm. and people have been looking for other channels like what else works and television i mean youtube's bigger than television i think in reach now but television still has a massive reach right. right it's it's one of the only channels that exists that has that kind of reach at least in the u.s mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure about other countries right i i'm curious about unit economics because you have a I mean, for for software, you have a small price tag, right? 240 ACV for a yearly subscription. But it looks like on the website, you guys actually do demos, calls with people, right? Is the idea that this is just in the beginning and eventually it's going to be complete self-serve? I can just imagine that it's super hard to make yeah. like a sales motion work with a 240 ACV. Yeah, we've been more focused initially on the sort of 46 million affluent high net worth families uh in in the united states um we have had some price resistance outside of that category um and sneak preview we're lowering our pricing um mm. in the next few months uh it's not really a secret but um we're gonna have a free price point a freemium 
uh, where you can manage all your identities uh, for free across your family. Um, we're going to have a $120 price point, which is pretty much everything except the business category. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we introduced a business category because lots of our members and their professionals uh, really demanded that. Um, and so if you have bu business or business interests, that's where the higher price point will be. If you're managing that added complexity in your trustworthy account, you'll pay that 240 price point. And then we've we've had a bundle. This is really interesting. What you're asking about service. We knew that having people see a demo of Trustworthy led to much higher conversion rates. Mm -hmm. So if you had a question of like, what what is a family operating system? I don't know what that is. Right. How does it work? Show me some of the functionality. And we would get on the phone for 15 to 20 minutes with folks and just give them a tour. Conversion rates for that were like 56% versus sort of 17, 18% self-service, right? So that's yep. a big delta. And really what that manifested to was, hey, look, we can't, we can't, uh, you can build a demo to do that essentially, right? That, that you don't need to get on the phone to do that. Yep. Demo may not answer all the questions, but would probably get you a big chunk of the way. What we also found was that people wanted help, that they wanted coaching or they wanted to outsource the work to someone else mm. to go from here's all my fragmented information today outside of Trustworthy to it's all beautifully organized and laid out in Trustworthy. And we had some people say to our support team, uh, just take my Dropbox nightmare and move it over and I'll pay you for that. Right. So we sold a bundle of software plus service. Um, I think it might even still be on the site today, uh, which is, you know, the software for a year plus three hours of service um, as an initial bundle. And you could buy that for, I think it's five ninety. Um, we now outsource that. We don't do that in-house. We've created a national network of trustworthy certified experts who can do that work for us. Mm -hmm. um, so if you buy that bundle, we try and connect you. We connect you with one of those folks, maybe in your state or in your region or your city, um, who can come on site if you want it, mm -hmm. uh, and just or you send all the files to, and they'll they'll take care of the work. Um, and they can work, you know, beyond way beyond that initial three hours if you if you want or need it. And some yep. people do. Love it. This is really applicable older generations who aren't as tech savvy. And it starts to get into that scenario of like, hey, I want this for my parents. Like I'm a, you know, I'm an adult child and I know my parents are getting older. Um, how do I get everything in their lives dialed in? And how do I build the treasure map for their mm -hmm. household? Because lots and lots of people have come to us and said, I want to get ahead of this problem because I've dealt with it with one parent or I've dealt with with both parents and I wish it had I wish they'd had trustworthy. Yep. One guy last two weeks ago we were at a show, he's like, I spent eight years unpacking my parents' estate. That's a lot of time <laughs> that could have at least been halved, if not, you know, a fraction of that. His parents had had the ability to sort of build the treasure map and trustworthy and include him in that and say, here's where everything is. And the process is frighteningly similar for everyone who has to go through this it's like there's the house there's all the property in the house there's all the uh, mail they start opening the mail right yeah and getting the bills they start uh hacking the passwords on their parents devices yeah you know, for all the accounts yep. and usually uh it's not that hard and they figure them out right right uh <laughs> so or, you know another reason to have trustworthy for for better security but that's a huge use case, especially right now with the great wealth transfer beginning, uh, the baby boomer generation retiring at a a, a, a fast, a really fast rate, uh, something like ten thousand a day for the next ten years, kind of thing. Wow, seventy, roughly seventy trillion in assets that is owned by that generation that will will be passing on to subsequent generations. All right. Um, so we're building this year. We're actually building a solution specific use case. Right. Interesting. Um, All right. La, la, uh, last question that I want to squeeze in here. Um, what were some of the mistakes that you made building this company that you wish you could have maybe avoided? Uh, it's not really a mistake, but I wish AI in its current manifestation had been around four years ago when we started. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. Because everything's changed. Everything's brand new. Everything's an opportunity again. Yeah. 
incumbent businesses, if they're not rebuilding themselves for an AI world, could easily get replaced by an AI upstart. And we're painfully aware of this. So we've put ourselves in that same position and said, okay, we were building Trustworthy Today from scratch. What would it be? Mm -hmm. Um, And how would we incorporate AI? And how would that actually be helpful to family members? So we have some really, really exciting stuff that's coming out uh, in April. That's a big release of stuff uh, with, with an AI underpinning to help families uh, more, what we call effortless organization, right? More effortlessly, more automatically get their documents dialed in, get everything securely put in trustworthy uh, with a minimum amount of effort. We compared the two, like the old trustworthy and the new trustworthy experience. And the new one is basically seven times faster uh, in terms of getting things set up. So a, a material difference in the amount of work, the amount of heavy lifting that you had to do, the amount of importing and all of that um, to get everything secure and trustworthy. Uh, and it's 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 going to be great. And it's going to be really helpful for families. We think it'll be a big lift for the business and that, uh, that folks will just snap to it and enjoy, enjoy sort of the automation that comes around of like, hey, I'm just going to connect some things to Trustworthy. Trustworthy is going to sort of automatically grab all those things decode yep. them for me, figure out what it is, tell me what to do with it, create expiration dates, like all of the automation that you would ex- expect from AI capabilities around your household documents and information. Cool. Well, that's very exciting. Um, I'm now going to chat with my wife to see whether this would make sense for us. Uh, thank you for your time and for building such an interesting product. I look at a lot of products because I do a lot of these interviews and obviously we're in the B2B space. Um, But, you know, a lot of them are kind of predictable. It's like, oh, another lead gen tool, another, you know, qualification, automation, AI, I don't know, thing. And this one definitely caught me a little off guard because there wasn't really any reference point, let's say. So I think it's a cool concept. So, yeah, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Finn. Great, great chatting with you. Appreciate it.